Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We're really excited uh, to speak with you. I think an important place to start in light of the kind of nation's response to the murder of George Floyd and um, the subsequent lack of action that was taken by local authorities before the protests began and uh, quite frankly, the aggressive response from the police in, uh, as a result of the peaceful protests. Uh, we've seen a lot of abdication from current uh, congressional um, representatives pointing at the fact that this is a local issue that needs to be addressed at a local level. Um, but seeing as how this has erupted in so many cities across our country, um, is there action that can be taken at a federal level to kind of rein in our police, which to most people seem almost out of control? Yeah, I, and I think you're right that it's, you know, people, oh, it's a local issue, but if you're a federal representative, what you do affects the entire country and you serve your constituents in your district, but you like what the decisions you make don't only affect your district, they affect the entire country. And we're also seeing people make the argument, oh, it's just a few bad apples in the police departments. Well, then why did a police officer yesterday put his knee on a protester's throat while that protest, holding the protester to the ground and put his knee on the throat? And that protester was protesting that a police officer in Minneapolis did that to somebody on Monday. And then we have, pro you know, yesterday in New York, you know, as of the time that we're recording this, yesterday in New York, two SUVs, two police SUVs ran over protesters. They were at a total stop, and then they just put, put the pedal to the metal and started running them over. I mean, just a crime in Charleston a few years ago. Um, if you recall, the, the man who drove his car into the crowd of protesters, except this time it came from the police. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it has yet to be confirmed, but there's a video that's gone, gotten a lot of views on Twitter of a police officer flashing a white power sign uh, in New York. And the attorney general of the state responded saying, please report this to my office. We're going to look into it. And so um, I really, you know, the whole idea that this is just a bad few apples. No, it's a systemic problem. And if, if, if you're looking at this and you can't see that it's a systemic problem, you know, I highly doubt that the Minneapolis Police Department and the Seattle Police Department are talk to, talking to each other and telling each other to put their knees on people's throats, yet they're doing it. And like, I guess there are, there are police groups on Facebook, they share memes, they talk to each other, but I don't really think this is coordinated with police departments across the entire country. It's a systemic problem that causes police to do this. And so as a federal response, what we need to do is um, so drastically defund the amount of federal money that's going to the police, stop sending military equipment to them. These are not military, uh, these are not soldiers or military officers. They're not trained to deal with it. Something that, um, really blew my mind was yesterday I was reading about tear gas and um, it is actually a, a chemical weapon and it was developed for the trenches of World War I um, and it was developed in the specific way it was to get around international treaties that existed at the time on using chemical warfare. So it's a chemical weapon that was designed for the trenches of World War I, like the horrors of the trenches, um, to drive people out of the trenches. Like it was designed to make people just overcome with panic um, not know what's happening, just intense pain, and then run out of the trench where they could then be shot. That's what's being used on the streets of our country. Uh, yeah, that was what was used uh, for me and Gavin both. Yeah, just yesterday when we were um, out covering the protests, it's been used pretty indiscriminately regardless of the, of the city you find yourself in. It's, it's quite shocking. Yeah, and it, it mm -hmm. seems incredibly ironic and uh, crazy that, you know, these police brutality protests, the, the police are being more brutal than ever. You know, it, it seems to be a complete disconnect between the citizens and uh, these increasingly militarized police forces which are occupying our communities. Um, you've talked about demilitarizing the police. Do you, would you go as far as to say defund the police forces? What, what, how can we begin rethinking uh, this issue in our country? One thing we should definitely do is strip away the sources of funding they have that are unjust, for example, cash bail, um, and also civil asset forfeiture because um, the police can um, seize your seize your assets. You know, pull you over. They they think you look like you're up to something. They seize your car, and um, they can they can literally just take this stuff, and they do not have to give it back. You have to go through a great deal of trouble to get it back. And like these civil asset forfeiture and cash bail, predominantly affect poor people and also people of color. 
And those are two things that we should, we should um, ban nationwide. That would take away a lot of the funding that police have. And um, I think we also need to have community board, community control boards providing oversight. They should be made up 100% of community members and not police. Um, and yeah, I think we should drastically defund them because uh, there are police forces in other countries that are far less um, militarized than ours and they they do not have the levels of violence that we do and it's also it's it's dangerous because um, both with the, the police wielding these weapons that are, are military grade weapons and they're not trained military but also in Seattle yesterday it would happen on the news um, I <clears throat> on like the video I just can't believe that it happened on the news and then I saw it on Twitter but um, a, a police car had been, um, I don't think this one was burned out, but it had been, you know, windows were smashed and stuff. And um, somebody got into it and stole two AR-15s out of the police car. And on, on camera, there was a guy just holding an AR-15, kind of deciding, hmm, what am I going to do with this? And then the, a, security, um, a security person for the news station that was recording this uh, ran up to him and seized it from him. Um, and so it's not just a danger to the police, but also I, why should anybody have AR-15s police or um, you don't need it for hunting, uh, school shooters. I mean, it's just we, we do not need this level of uh, weaponry out in a domestic, like on, on domestic soil. Yeah, um, just to kind of follow up on that with you and, and, and give you an opportunity to discuss what kind of gun reform policy you would uh, like to see occurring in this country. Uh, not just from a police level, but we also do have a, a, a problem with sy systemic vi violence, um, you know, active shooters, situations uh, like that, because it is quite frankly terribly easy to, in most states, uh, acquire a gun that can do massive amounts of damage. Um, while still understanding that, yes, there's this is a culture, uh, this is a country with a deep culture of hunting and, you know, um, personal arms use, uh, how would you, how do you envision uh, gun control reform in this country? Yeah, and it's a good question. And, you know, my district is, it includes rural areas and cities and small towns. And the Olympic Peninsula, um, there is a culture of uh, hunting and fishing and people eat, you know, a lot of people eat what they hunt and fish and um, they, they should be able to do that. And there's a culture of um, responsible gun ownership and, and pride and heritage in that in this country. Um, and the types of gun laws that I support, gun reform, um, would not impact the ability of people to to continue that. Um, the stuff I support is things like um, mandatory and universal background checks, including at gun shows, um, full federal funding to modernize and optimize existing background check systems and make them compatible across all 50 states so there aren't any, um, people don't fall through the cracks and kind of take advantage of loopholes. Um, requiring free safety training and continuing education for all licensed firearm owners. You know, there is uh, required training in some um, places, but you have to pay for it. And so um, if you're a poor person who hunts to feed your family, that fee might not be accessible for you, but it is for, you know, a very a rich, a rich person. So I think that should be free. Um, I think that we should ban the release of the names of mass shooters um, because those communities of, of white supremacists and um, misogynists who, um, you know, in, in online forums are like, they, they glorify the mass shooters and they, um, part of, big part of the reason they do it is to seek glorification of their own name. So I think that we should ban the release of their names um, so that they don't have that as a source or a reason to do that. Um, and then I think we also need, I support Medicare for all, which is uh, sing, for anybody listening who doesn't know, single payer healthcare, meaning you can go to the doctor hospital without having to pay co-pays, deductibles, premiums. As part of that, we need to increase funding for mental health because 60% of gun deaths um, are suicides. So that's something that we really need to look at. Yeah. Um, and uh, on Medicare for all and a lot of those proposals there, uh, you're, you're totally funded by small dollar donations, which would make you unaccountable to the some of the corporations that traditionally uh, hold funding over the heads of our elected officials uh, in return for the policy agenda that they wish to see fulfilled. Um, like I said, your campaign is totally funded by small dollar donations, but the same can't be said for your opponent, the incumbent representative, Derek Kilmer, who was uh, a Clinton delegate in 2016 and is kind of a basic establishment Democrat. 
aside from campaign finance, does your or what does your candidacy offer to your community that uh, Kilmer's does not? Yeah, he um, he's ranked by GovTrack, an independent nonprofit, as the eleventh most conservative Democrat in the House, and it's just wild to me because this district has been blue for fifty-five years. Um, so he's very out of touch with the district, what we want and need. And some of the ways we're different is um, he doesn't support Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, national rent control, um, free public college and trade school, or canceling medical and student debt. And I do. Uh, he also likes to talk about how he fights against Trump's agenda, but he actually votes with Trump a lot. He voted to extend the Patriot Act, um, voted to give funding to ICE without sufficient protections for migrants. He voted for uh, warrantless surveillance of Americans' um, internet usage and browsing history. Um, he voted to um, for Trump's war budget. I mean, on and on, he votes like this with Trump um, while putting forward the space of him being, you know, a good Democrat who fights Trump. And so it's very hypocritical. And that's a big part of the reason I decided to run is I just, I can't stand hypocrisy in politics. And, you know, the job, you know, politicians, uh, rightly, you know, a lot of people don't like politicians. They're seen as sleazy. I think they've earned the reputation. But um, I mean, the job itself is supposed to be about service. And the, the House of Representatives is the people's house. You're supposed to serve the people, not corporations, not, not you know, some rich uh, billionaire in the White House, like the people of your district. Um, so we're different in a lot of ways on that. You know, he, um, yeah, just, just does not support the policies that would really help people with the problems they're facing in our district with housing, addiction, mental health care, lack of good jobs, uh, climate change. Um, there are a lot of tribes in my district who live on the coastline. They're having to leave behind uh, villages um, that are on the coast and move them farther upland. And they have lived there in those locations since time immemorial. So, um, I mean, imagine having to leave behind an area where your people have lived since um, before the time of the Roman Empire. I mean, that's how long they've been living there. Um, it's a huge loss. So. Um. That's actually one of the reasons that we were really excited um, to talk to you is uh, you made it a very central in most of your uh, campaigning that you're, you're unwilling to be bought. Um, but with so many crises occurring simultaneously around our country from our uh, government's inability to act in the interest of people, whether that's from law enforcement, uh, unequivocally siding with the police or pumping trillions of dollars into Wall Street while millions of Americans are uninsured and unemployed in the time of a pandemic. Uh, what would you tell voters who believe that the system can't be saved by working within the system, that um, both sides of the aisle are corrupt and they've seen it, you know, throughout their lives? Um, what, what, what would you tell them to get them out to the polls one more time? I think a lot can be done. Um, for example, if you look at AOC, um, like, e and even Nancy Pelosi says, oh, the squad, there are only four votes. That's all the power they have. Well, that may be true in a strict sense in the House. Each of them has one vote. There are only four people. But if it were not for AOC and the Sunrise Movement, literally nobody would be talking about the Green New Deal. Um, the Sunrise Movement and the Youth Movement, the Youth Climate Movement, um, are the drivers. And then AOC came to that protest outside Nancy Pelosi's office and just kind of sky it rocketed to national attention. And everybody was talking about it. And a lot, I mean, it's supported by majority of Democratic voters. So is Medicare for all. So for example, Bernie Sanders, I'm still really disappointed that he didn't win. Um, but because of him, everybody's talking about Medicare for all. And the majority of all voters, uh, not just Democrats, support that. So that's one really big thing. Like, let's say that 20 progressives get into into the house this year um that's out of 435 you might think well that's not very much what can they do but a small group of people inside can do a lot both like raising awareness of issues like um, the squad and aoc have done but then also like the the freedom caucus in the house which started around 2010 they uh, had a huge influence on the direction of american politics and that was i think um that caucus started with only 10 people um, and I mean, they've, they're a big reason that the Republican Party has gone off the deep end and so far right. Um, so you, a small number of people can have um, impact. And then also, you know, there's electoral politics, you know, is not the only way you make change. It's the way that I'm working on, but people work in labor, uh, union organizing, tenant organizing, um, protect, you know, protesting out on the streets about um, police brutality towards black people. 
Um, there's lots of different ways electoral is just one, but it is one way that has can have a lot of influence. You spoke about the Freedom Caucus, and uh, that brings to mind Alexander Ocasio-Cortez's plan to put together a progressive caucus, which would kind of try to emulate um, a similar strategy that was so effective on the right wing. Um, she ultimately abandoned that plan seemingly in the wake of the implosion of Senator Sanders' campaign. But uh, would you consider organizing such a caucus to try to uh, really put some pressure on the more corporate factions of the Democratic leadership? Yeah, I definitely would. And I think we need it because, um, I mean, if you look at the caucuses that are in the House right now, so there's the New Democrats, which um, Derek Gilmer, my opponent, is the chair of. And that's the third way of Clintonian, you know, conservative wing of the party. It's the largest democratic caucus in the house. They said, I mean, they said they have so much power. They really, you know, Derek Kilmer and the new Democrats they kind of fly under the radar, but they're responsible for raising tens and tens of millions of dollars, supporting the centrist, opposing the progressives, squashing progressive policy. So we have them. Then we have the Problem Solvers Caucus, which uh, Derek Kilmer is a part of. And that's, um, they build themselves as quote unquote bipartisan, but uh, half, they're half Democrat, half Republican, but they're funded by Republican billionaires. It's a very conservative caucus. And then we have the Progressive Caucus, which is very large, but it has people in the New Democrats who are also in the Progressive Caucus. So how can they really be, <laughs> how can you have people in the uh, Progressive Caucus who don't believe in Medicare for all? I don't, you know. So I think we do need another caucus and I would work on organizing it. And what exactly the criteria would be, I don't know, but at least one of them would be not taking any corporate money, no corporate PAC money, no lobbyist money. And if there's even, you know, five to 10 people in that caucus and they're, you know, we're all committed to uh, working together, strategizing, being willing to take hard votes and withstand pressure from leadership, uh, we could have a lot of power and build power for the progressive movement that way. Um, you've made environmental justice a central part of your campaign. Uh, embracing the Green New Deal, as you've mentioned, and, and you know the aggressive need for uh, sweeping environmental um, policy to be enacted immediately. Um, and as you mentioned before, AOC uh, came into office as an aggressive firebrand on that message. She protested with the Sunrise Movement outside of Nancy Pelosi's office. However, I think it, it should be mentioned that as AOC's tenure in Washington has grown, she has sided with the more establishment Democrats more and more. She recently came out as pro-nuclear um, and expanding the nu uh, nuclear energy and allowing that to be entered into the uh, Green New Deal. Um, what is your stance on nuclear power? And um, if elected, how would you uh, resist the pressures to pacify your demands within the Democratic Party? Well, in terms of res um, withstanding you know, the pressures and uh, from leadership in the Democratic Party, um, it's you have to be accountable to to organizations outside of Congress, and so one organization that I'm, I'm accountable to is the DSA, and to my local DSA chapters. And for example, there's an agreement with my like Tacoma DSA, which I'm part of and I'm very active with, is that if they endorse a candidate, the candidate agrees to meet with them on at least a quarterly basis. Um, and there's you know it's not like you just come in as me as a candidate and use the resources to get into office and then they thanks by and you never hear from me again. There has to be some accountability and communication. And then also, I think that the left uh, needs to build up more power um, to hold people accountable. Like, you know, for example, and some kind of, you know, whether it's DSA, as it already exists, um, I don't know how exactly what it would look like. But saying if you, you know, get in and then betray us, we will replace you, we'll kick you out and we'll replace you. Um, and that's what the Labour Party in the UK did. Um, they're, one of their co-founders became prime minister, and then he adopted an austerity uh, agenda and betrayed them. And they kicked him out of the Labour Party while he was in office as prime minister. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that I think people on the left need to be willing to do with their leaders who betray them. Um, however you define betraying, um, but th there needs to be that kind of accountability. On nuclear, um, it's, you know, there's one uh, type, there's one way to, um, I can't, no, I can't remember what it's called, but um, Bill Gates, his foundation did research into it. Um, apparently there's a new method to use nuclear waste 
in a way to create energy and it it spends the waste so that the waste is then gone and it does not have to be then dumped in uh, almost always poor communities like in Nevada or other places across the country where you know uh, they they can't fight back they don't have the money to say no um, and this waste gets dumped in their yard this waste can be taken used in a very safe way much much lower chance of uh, meltdowns and um, then the waste itself is is used up and no longer exists. I think that's one thing to look at, uh, not generating new nuclear energy, but in a safe way using what exists, just getting it out of the system. Because, I mean, I remember this was a concern, like, you know, almost 20 years ago when I was in 10th grade biology class. And they were one of their projects they had us do, like the teacher had us do, was like design um she was like the teacher said okay so imagine we we put all this nuclear waste in a mountain in nevada and it lasts for millions and millions of years um so imagine there's a future civilization that comes and they don't speak um any human language um they don't recognize any of our symbols or music or anything how are you going to design something that um communicates to them that this is dangerous <laughs> that's that's how long nuclear waste lasts. It's very it's very concerning. So I think it's a good question to bring up. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thanks so much. We definitely uh, need that kind of energy in the Democratic Party and uh, that willingness willingness to buck orthodoxy and kind of fight back against the parties. And uh, yeah, we're really hoping that you can um, succeed in your primary coming up in August. Yeah. Something that we thought was really powerful in one of your campaign videos was about how corporations constantly pillage natural resources uh, from the communities that can't fight back. And you see that um, in, you know, Latino communities in Nevada, like you mentioned, you see it in white communities in Appalachia and West Virginia. Uh, you see it all over the country and it's affecting all of the working um, people. Um, can you speak of some of the environmental pillaging that's currently going on in Washington? Yeah, definitely. One is in my district, the timber industry. So the Olympic Peninsula, which for anyone not from this area, if you just picture the northwestern tip of the state, that's the Olympic Peninsula. And that's in my district. And it's absolutely beautiful. It has the Olympic National Forest and Park in it. Um, like just miles and miles of coastline. It's just um, amazing. It's right up next to Canada. Very beautiful. Um, and there are ancient, you know, old growth ancient forests on the Olympic Peninsula that have been there forever. Um, and timber companies like Weyerhaeuser came in, extracted all the timber they were legally allowed to, um, shipped it off. I mean, after the, the post-war boom, after World War II, um, the, the, the boards that built the houses across the country came from the Olympic Peninsula. So these companies came in, they extracted all these resources, extracted their profit, and then they just up and left. And they just left a gaping hole where all these jobs used to be. And a friend of mine um, who's from the area and she's running for state legislature, Mariana Hopkins Everson, she describes it as if a community could have PTSD, this is what it would look like. Um, you know, a lot of the problems that we're uh, recognizing now, like homelessness and um, the addiction, have been problems in that area in, on the Olympic Peninsula for decades. And it's now like the rest of the country is sadly catching up. But the, this is in these places, it's been a problem for decades. And I mean, getting back to our earlier discussion about hunting, um, Weyerhaeuser, uh, they had to, you know, replant all the forest, but it, it takes a long time before those trees are uh, can then be logged. And so they're not doing anything with the land. They get they pay extremely low tax rates on acres and acres of land. And um, people in that area used to go on to Weyerhaeuser land to hunt and you'd eat what they hunted. And then Weyerhaeuser put up fences to stop them from going uh, on, on the land to hunt. And it's like, um, like Robin Hood days and there's a royal forest and the poachers aren't allowed onto the hunting grounds. I mean, it is like, a, it's medieval. Like these, like they just treat people like serfs, come in and use what they want, use the resources, use the labor, and then just up and disappear. And then like, if you try to just get food for your family, we'll screw you. Um, yeah, that's, that's one way that we're seeing this kind of environmental devastation here. And another one is um, the orca population of orca whales. Um, the orca population in the Puget Sound and on the U.S. side of the border is um, in danger of going extinct. But on the northern side of the border in Canada, um, they are doing fine. They're thriving. And um, a lot of it is um, in this area, we have um, dams and that have been built and it prevents salmon from going down the river. 
the whales eat the, the orcas eat the, uh, the salmon. Um, so that some of those dens need to be breached. Um, ocean acidification as part of climate change is very damaging to the orca whales. Um, so there's stuff like that as well where um, it affects the orca population, but then also um, the tribes on the coast, they have a tradition going back thousands of years of hunting whales. So if the whale population is going extinct, um, they have to get like special permission to hunt like one whale a year or something like that, whereas it used to be a very large part of their culture. So it's very um, negatively impactful. Um, well, Rebecca, we certainly ap really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And we also certainly appreciate all the work that you're doing in um, your community. Uh, can you tell people how they can support you? Yeah, uh, you can go to Rebecca for WA.com and if you can afford to donate, I don't take any corporate PAC or lobbyist money. So you might think oh, I can only give a dollar. I don't know, you know, that, that dollar helps. It funds calls for our phone bankers. Um, and then you can also help out by volunteering. We have phone banks every day of the week, sometimes more than more than once a day. And you can do it from anywhere from home safely. Um, so you can sign up to volunteer at the events page on my website and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Rebecca for WA. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.